Good morning. I'm going to continue with question 10. We're on page 181. Questions about power from the 10 questions people ask from the book Getting to Yes. There is power in understanding interests. The more clearly you understand the other side's concerns, the better able you will be to satisfy them at minimum cost to yourself. Look for intangible or hidden interests that may be important. With concrete interests like money, Ask what lies behind them. For what will the money be used? Sometimes even the most firmly stated and unacceptable position reflects an underlying interest that is compatible with your own. Consider the businessman who was trying to buy a radio station. The majority owner was willing to sell his two-thirds of the station for a reasonable figure. But the one-third owner and the current manager of the station was demanding what seemed an exorbitant price for her third. The businessman had raised his offer several times to no avail, and he was beginning to consider abandoning the deal. Finally, the businessman inquired more deeply into the second owner's interests. He learned that the second owner had less interest in money than she did in continuing to manage a radio station of which she was a part owner. The businessman offered to buy only that portion of the owner's share he needed for tax reasons and to keep her on as a manager. The second owner attempted this offer at a price that saved the businessman almost a million dollars. Understanding the seller's underlying interests had greatly enhanced the buyer's negotiating power. Next, there is power in inventing an elegant option. <clears throat> Excuse me. Successful brainstorming increases your ability to influence others. Once you understand the interests of each side, it is often possible, as in the radio station example above, to invent a clever way of having those interests dovetail. Sometimes this can be done by devising an ingenious process option. Consider the sealed bid stamp auction. The auctioneer would like bidders to offer the most they might conceivably be willing to pay for the stamps in question. Each potential buyer, however, does not want to pay more than necessary. In a regular sealed bid auction, each bidder tries to offer slightly more than their best guess of what others will bid, which is often less than the bidder would be willing to pay. But in a stamp auction, the rules state that the highest bidder gets the stamps at the price of the second highest bid. Buyers can safely bid exactly as much as they would be willing to pay to get the stamps because the auctioneer guarantees that they will not have to pay it. No bidder is left wishing that he or she had bid more and the higher bidder is happy to pay less than was offered. The auctioneer is happy knowing 
that the difference between the highest and the second highest bids is usually smaller than the overall increase in the level of bids under this system versus a regular sealed bid auction. And the asterisk here is a process similar to this can be used in all kinds of allocation decisions, even when the issue is as volatile as where to site a hazardous waste facility. C. Howard Raffa, R-A-I-F-F-A, from a hypothetical speech to a hypothetical audience about a very real problem. Um, it's the program on negotiation at Harvard Law School, working paper number 85-5. All right, let me finish here. finish here my love um, there is power in using external standards of legitimacy you can use standards of legitimacy both as a sword to persuade others and as a shield to help you resist pressure to give in arbitrarily I would like to give you a discount but this price is firm it is what General Motors paid for the same item last week. Here is the bill of sale. Just as, by finding relevant precedent and principles, a lawyer enhances his or her ability to persuade a judge, so a negotiator can enhance his or her negotiation power by finding precedents principles and other external criteria of fairness and by thinking of ways to present them forcefully and tellingly. For example, I am asking for no more and no less than you are paying others for comparable work. Or comparable work. Woo, that's beautiful. Okay. We will pay what the house is worth if we can afford it. We are offering what the similar house nearby sold for last month. Unless you can give us a good reason why your house is worth more, our offer remains firm and unchanged. Convincing the other side that you are asking for no more than is fair is one of the most powerful arguments you can make. And the next, there is power in developing a good BATNA. BATNA is best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Fallback plan. As we argue in chapter six, a fundamental way to increase your negotiation power is by improving your walk away alternative. An attractive BATNA is a strong argument with which to persuade the other side of the need to offer more. Like, the firm across the street has offered me 20% above what I am now earning. I would rather stay here, but with the cost of living, unless I can get a good raise soon, I will have to consider moving on. What do you think might be possible? In addition, to improving your overall BATNA, what you will do if the negotiations fail to produce an agreement. You should also prepare your micro BATNA. If no agreement is reached at this meeting, what is the best outcome? It helps to draft in advance a good exit line to use if a meeting is inconclusive. Their example for that is, thank you for sharing your views and for listening to mine. 
If I decide to go forward, I will get back to you, perhaps with a fresh proposal. Sometimes it is possible, quite legitimately, to worsen the other side's batten. For example, a father we know was trying to get his young son to move, to move, to mow the lawn. <laughs> he offered a significant amount of money, but to no avail. Finally, the son inadvertently revealed his batna. But dad, I don't need to mow the lawn to get money. You uh, leave your wallet on the dresser every weekend. The father quickly changed his son's batna by not leaving his wallet out and making clear that he disapproved of taking money without asking. The son started mowing the lawn. The tactic of worsening the other side's batna can be used to coerce or exploit, but it, but it can also help ensure a fair outcome. Efforts to improve one's own alternatives and to lower the other side's estimate of theirs are critical ways to enhance your negotiating power. And the next. There is power in making a carefully crafted commitment. One additional source of persuasive power deserves attention. Power of making commitments. You can use a commitment to enhance your negotiating power in three ways. You can commit to what you will do, for example, by making a firm offer. You can, with care, make a negative commitment as to what you will not do. And you can clarify precisely what commitments you would like the other side to make. Clarify what you will do. One way to enhance your negotiating power is to make a firm, well-timed offer. When you make a firm offer, you provide one option that you will accept, making it clear at the same time that you are not foreclosing discussion of other options. If you want to persuade someone to accept a job, don't just talk about it. Make an offer. By making an offer, you give up your chance to haggle for better terms, but you gain by simplifying the other side's choice and making it easier for them to commit. To reach agreement, all they have to say is yes. Making an offer of what you will do if they agree to the terms you are proposing is one way to overcome any fear the other side may have of starting down a slippery slope. Without a clear offer, even a painful situation may seem preferable to accepting a pig in a poke, especially if the other side fears that a favorable indication will encourage you to ask for more. In 1990, the UN Secretary, uh, sorry, in 1990, the UN Security Council sought to influence Iraq to withdraw from Kuwait by imposing sanctions. The Council's resolutions clearly stated that Iraq must withdraw, but did not see, but did not state that upon withdrawal, sanctions would end. All right, I'm going to read that again. I think I'm going to do better this time. All right. Give me a little wet my whistle. See if that don't make it a little better. All right. Here we go. I'm scared to see how close I am to the end, so I'm going to stay focused. 
In 1990, the UN Security Council sought to influence Iraq to withdraw from Kuwait by imposing sanctions. The Council's resolutions clearly stated that Iraq must withdraw, but did not state that upon withdrawal sanctions would end. If Saddam Hussein believed that sanctions would continue after Iraq withdrew from Kuwait, then those sanctions, though unpleasant, provide no incentive for Iraq to leave. The more concrete the offer, the more persuasive. Thus, a written offer may be more credible than an oral one. A real estate agent we know likes to have a client make an offer by stacking bundles of $100 bills on the table. You may also want to make your offer a fading opportunity by indicating when and how it will expire. For example, President Reagan's inauguration in 1981 created a fading opportunity in the negotiations for the release of the American diplomat hostages held in Iran. The Iranians did not want to have to start negotiating again with a new U.S. administration. In some cases, you may also want to clarify what you will do if the other side does not accept your proposal. They may not realize the consequences of your batna for them. If we can't get heat in our apartment this evening, I will have to call the health department emergency line. Are you aware that they charge landlords a $250 fine when they respond and find a violation of the statute? All right. Consider committing to what you will not do. Sometimes you can persuade the other side to accept an offer better than their BATNA by convincing them that you cannot or will not offer more. Take it or leave it. You not only make an offer, you tie your hands against changing it. As discussed in Chapter 1, locking into a position has significant costs. Locking in early limits communication and runs the risk of damaging the relationship by making the other side feel ignored or coerced. There is less risk in locking in after you have come to understand the other side's interests and have explored options for joint gains and it will do less damage to your reputation with the other side if there are credible reasons independent of your will to explain and justify your rigidity. At some point, it may be best to put a final offer on the table and mean it. Doing so tends to influence the other side by worsening their micro batna. At this point, if they say no, they no longer have the op have opened the possibility of reaching a better agreement with you. Clarify what you want them to do. It pays to think through the precise terms of the commitment you want the other side to make. This ensures that your demand makes sense. Susan promises never to interrupt me again when I'm on the telephone. Could easily be disastrous if Susan took her promise literally in an emergency. You want to avoid a sloppy commitment that is overbroad, fails to bind the other side, leaves out crucial information, or is not operational especially when you want the other side to do something. It makes sense to tell them exactly what it is you want them to do. Otherwise, they may do nothing, not wanting to do more than they have to. In 
in the fall of 1990, for example, the ability of the United States to influence Saddam Hussein was undercut by ambiguity about what would satisfy the U.S. At different times, the withdrawal of Iraqi troops from Kuwait, the destruction of Iraqi nuclear facilities, the dismantling of Iraq military capability, and the overthrow of Saddam Hussein all seemed to be possible U.S. goals. All right, and then here is the last part from this book. <clears throat> Thank you again for being with me. Beautiful sunrise. Come out a little further if I can. Let's see. 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 You should use each source of power in harmony with other sources. Negotiators sometimes look for their strongest source of power and try to use it alone. For example, if a negotiator has a strong batna, he or she may confront the other side with it, threatening to walk away unless the last offer is accepted. This is likely to detract from the persuasive power of the negotiator's arguments about why the offer is fair. If you are going to communicate your BATNA, it would be better to do so in ways that respect the relationship, leave open the possibility of two-way communication, underscore the legitimacy of your last offer, Suggest how that offer meets the other side's interests, and so forth. The total impact of such negotiation power as you have will be greater if each element is used in ways that reinforce the others. You will also be more effective as a negotiator if you believe in what you are saying and doing. Whatever use you are able to make of the ideas in this book. Don't wear them as though you were wearing someone else's clothes. Cut and fit what we say until you find an approach that both makes sense and is comfortable for you. This may require experimentation and a period of adjustment that is not so comfortable. But in the end, you are likely to maximize your negotiation power if you believe what you say and say what you believe. And that's the end. Oh my lord, it's beautiful. Here's the book I've been reading. Getting to, yeah. Well, I appreciate you. We have made it through another one. It's so beautiful. Now, some of the ones I listened to, I think yesterday's that I listened to, I could not hear the cicadas. I can vaguely hear them now, but there's a sprinkler going. Oh. I appreciate you. Thank you for letting me share my book with you. I'll be starting something new next. <laughs>